you all know who I am. Um, I'm going to be talking about how a high risk mineralogy might help initiate, or might not help initiate, uh, intermediate dead earthquakes. Um, so this uh, background picture is a photograph of um, my field area and Cape Coast. Um, and I'll be talking more about that in a minute. So just to remind you guys, intermediate depth earthquakes are those that occur in association with subduction zones in convergent margins. And they occur between depths of about 50 to 300 kilometers. So in this um, diagram of the subduction zone, and that little red star is approximately where previous PT work has placed the rocks that we're looking at. So at about maximum depth of 80 kilometers and an ambient temperature of about 420 degrees. So a very cold, steep geotherm. Now, the problem with getting pseudocatalytes at 80 kilometers depth is that the high differential stresses should inhibit any type of brittle failure or seismic cohesion loss. So in this diagram of rock strength versus depth, you can see the two green stars, which indicate the... <laughs> so you can see these two uh, green stars, which indicate where you would typically get um, normal brittle faulting. The red star indicates um, where we get uh, oxidotacolites forming at their maximum depth. Um, so as you can see, rock strength decreases with the increase in depth. Um, but actually, because the pseudotacolites that we're studying are located in pristine lozenges of subducted peridotite and gabbro, they're actually a bit more rigid and a bit stronger than the surrounding mass and material. So they're sort of located more or less here. So we're at an advantage for producing um, brittle failure. So just to quickly show you one horrible more diagram. <laughs> um, there are two ways in which you can induce cohesion loss at high differential stresses. The first way is to move the Mohr circle to the failure envelope and bring it into the brittle field. And you can do this by um, increasing pore fluid pressure, decreasing confining pressure, and then inducing brittle failure. The second way is to bring the failure envelope to the, to the Mohr circle. And we can do this by decreasing the coefficient of friction in the rock and allowing it to weaken and fail more readily. So this brings us to uh, a series of failure processes that we can have producing these pseudotacolites. Um, basically, I'm, looking, I'm just going to introduce you to two end member processes. The one that is more commonly known is dehydration and brittlement. And, um, this is a purely brittle process and involves the dehydration of hydrous minerals, which are pre-existing in the wall rock material. When they dehydrate, they produce water, which increases the pore fluid pressure in the rock, decreases effective confining pressure, and allows brittle failure. So this process is compositionally dependent um, on the minerals within the rock, and it's uh, experimentally and uh, numerically modeled as a monomineralic solid state reaction generally. An example of it would be if you had serpentine in the wall rock, which dehydrates to produce um, sort of nanocrystalline olivine and water. Um, and it's important to know that this process does not necessarily require high shear stresses or shear stresses at all, or very high temperatures. It tends to occur at about 600 degrees or less. The other process is thermal instability. <coughs> which requires that the rock behaves as a viscoelastic material, which I'm sure you're all <laughs> familiar with, um, requires that there is a time-dependent viscosity effect on the rock. And basically, if you have a, a pre-existing weakness in the rock or a viscosity contrast, um, you have a sort of an area of low viscosity, with high viscosity around the rock, uh, around the bulk rock composition, um, and you apply stress to this rock, and then that low viscosity area will concentrate the stress, and if it's viscoelastic material, strain rate and temperature increase exponentially with each other, which results in flash, flash heating and decreasing the coefficient of friction in the rock, weakening it, 
and causing it to fuse, which induces cohesion loss. So this process is a purely ductile end member, and it's dependent on the mechanical properties of minerals in the rock, not the chemistry. So it could be anything from a crystallographic preferred orientation, grain size, or crystal lattice type that can induce this type of process. Historically, dehydration and brittlement has been favored for inducing intermediate depth earthquakes. Um, and this is because uh, in the past, we've been more, it's, it's been easier to recreate this experimentally. And thermal instabilities have been less favored because constants used in the equations um, define this process. And also, experimentally, it's been harder to produce. So that's really the only reason why it hasn't been favored. And this is the idea that I'm basically going to try and sell to you today. So I just want to come into the picture of subduction zone seismicity. Well, in the past, geophysics and modeling done on, sub on subduction zones has shown that when we get the epicenters of earthquakes, you know, intermediate depth earthquakes, uh, they are also located where we would predict high abundances of hydrous minerals to occur in the subducting slab. So these white dots all indicate epicenters of intermediate depth earthquakes. And these are the different hydrous minerals that we would expect in different areas within the slab. And these numbers indicate their water contents. So the red star, which again indicates roughly where um, the rocks I'm studying occur. And this puts them sort of in a serpentine, chlorophane, port type zone. So geophysics and, um, and geophysical modeling and numerical modeling are all indirect methods of studying earthquakes and, and how they are generated. My project basically involves ground tracing this, going to these actual rocks and seeing what they have to say on the matter of earthquake generation. So. As Torge already told you, it's involved going to the north of Corsica, in this area of Prep Course by San Ferran. And where we have an exhumed opiolite complex. Um, so uh, this is the image which I showed you earlier. And what we see is here um, we have uh, these pristine lozenges of perotitite here and gabbro which have been, which are pretty much pristine and have a slight pollutionist overprint, um, and they are bounded by myelinite shear zones, and there's a, the prototype is sort of ensconced within serpentinite. But the pseudotacolites only occur within the most pristine lozenges of these rocks. So, just a little bit of background. Um, the, this complex I'm looking at is the Schuster complex, um, and it's an alpine subduction complex. Once again, the red star is where we are, and um, it's important to note that the seismic pseudotacolite generation might, be, might have been associated with either a prograde subduction process or a retrograde ex exhumation process. So the pseudotacolites could have formed during either down, uh, the downgoing part or the, or the exhumation part. So this is um, what the exhumed ophiolite looks like in the field, and there may be some people in the picture that you recognize. And if we zoom in on outcrop, we see that these pseudotacolites are very thick and very large. They're about uh, 35 centimeters in thickness, at the maximum thickness. Um, and you can see that they're sort of a, they stick out very well from the rock. It's very easy to spot them. They either have a, a very positive or negative relief. So if you train your eye, you can spot them. My work mostly involves zooming in even closer into these rocks of the micro scale and studying um, the presence or lack thereof of hydrous minerals in the host rock, what's going on with the hydrous minerals in the vein more up boundary, um, what's going on with the entrained more up material, how it behaves in veins, and also studying in detail a pseudotacolytic matrix, which I'm going to define for the purposes of this talk as um, a bulk matrix uh, composition, which I analyzed with the microprobe as com composing a glassy matrix, uh, small devitrification products, 
um, small chunks of ultra comminuted borax material and any fluids involved in the, in the mouth. They were too small to separate with the bee. So just one caveat before I go into my results. Uh, we took a lot of great care in the work that we've done to separate later hydration over printing from early hydration, which might, which may have been associated with melting. So using thin section and uh, photography and very detailed BSC work, we took a lot of care to separate what late overprinting looks like and how it destroys the delicate textures of these mounts, and to stay away from it and just look at the most uh, the most pristine and well preserved creatures. So I studied both the prototypes and Gabro together. Uh, they occur often, uh, I mean they occur within say 15 meters of each other and sometimes they actually occur in contact. So I used the comparison of the pseudotype light forming in both rock types to try and bring out, uh, to sort of corroborate it, with the different types of mineralogies and any differences I see in the processes to bring up a sort of more unified idea of how these pseudotactylides form and um, sort of what style of melting we see. So starting with the parentides, uh, you can see this is a pseudotactylide vein here, a transitional boundary in the war rock and war rock material. Uh, we see that the parentide contains pre-existing hydrous minerals, and uh, this is also a pseudotatellite here, that have started to consume a hydrous mineralogy in the water, which is pre-existing. Here we also have a chlorate and dioxide uh, aggregate that has been trained into the mouth and has started to disseminate. In the gabbro, uh, instead of seeing chlorate, we see actinolites and horn veins dominating in the water. Uh, which later get exploited by the pseudotatellite vein. So here we have the vein boundary with the melt, and a horn blend which is being preparation is consumed by the melt. So we know that hydrous minerals uh, pre-existed in the pseudotatellites and were consumed by them. Um, looking at the textures that we see at the vein boundaries and the prototypes, we see sort of ductile folding, shearing, and prolate brains forming at the vein boundaries as they get dragged into the veins. And if we look very closely at some veins using BSC imaging, so this line here is 50 microns, we see um, this is a brain from the wall rock boundary, and this is a pseudotacolite. This is a transitional zone between the wall rock and the vein boundary, and you can see that it's very clearly a ductile shear of fabric. So the gabbro, you can see it even more clearly. Um, you see these prolate grains which have been sheared into, uh, into the vein. Um, you see deformation between the plagioclase and the cube banding and the CPX over here. And you can actually see peeled prolate grains that have been um, bolted. Um, and torn into the pseudotactylite veins, which also shows sort of ductile brittle fabric. Going into the geochemistry, um, we start with the parentite. Um, it's a lot simpler than the gabbro. So these black dots indicate the uh, bulk matrix, which I described to you earlier. The gray dots are the wall rock material, which I analyzed with XRF. Um, and these are the different wall rock minerals. So we have dioxide, tremolite, olivine, incitite, uh, crosphenol, and um, chloride. And you can see that uh, the composition of the bulk matrix is well constrained by the wall rock minerals, indicating potentially near wholesale 100% melting of the peridotide wall rock, except that there's this very strong trend towards the chloride composition. So these black dots indicate the bulk matrix composition, where I would have uh, borne the beam in this area. And these are your wall rock minerals, which I would have sampled. Looking at the quench products from these pseudotacolites, um, we see some very interesting things. Um, so it's the same diagram as before, but all the symbols are quench products from pseudotacolites. So when the peridotide melts, 
It melts instatite, diopside, tremolite, and chlorite, and then crystallizes chlorite, diopside, instatite, and all of as well. And all of you must melt. So you see these uh, complex, these dendrite complexes of olivine, and the CPX and instatite complex last growing around it, in a matrix of other little complexes trying to grow, and a cemented matrix of a combination of comminuted material and simple crystals coming directly from the mouth. Um, looking in other areas of, the, of veins, we see the same kind of matrix of crystallizing um, microcrystals and glass. And interestingly, when we, when we zoom in on minerals that are disseminating, so this is a, an aggregate of trimite and diopside, you see these glassy rooms, which I've studied with synchrotron XRD and EBSD, so I've managed to confirm that they are in fact glass. And when we analyze the composition, they have, they have uh, near whole mineral compositions. And um, this one in particular has a very chlorite type flavor. Um, chlorite in the previous image of it over here, and this is the glass formed from a fused chlorite in that complex. And if we look closer at, uh, or in more detail, at that glass, we see that here we have the wall of chlorite, which fused the glass, which um, melted from it. Uh, the, uh, the bulk matrix composition, which is very closely related to both these compositions, olivine, dioxide, and trinolite. So you can see a very strong relationship between the bulk matrix composition and chlorite and the chloride glass, in this case. Looking at uh, H2O, which uh, we used um, loss of ignition as a proxy, this is Mg number of the same sample. We have, you can see that this is chloride. Um, it has up to 13% water in it. And this is the glass which, crystal, um, which forms from the fusion of this aggregate, and we see that it's you know, pretty much just as hydrous, but a little bit more mafic, which is to be expected. Um, it's also clearly well related to the matrix once again. And these gray blocks indicate the wall rock material um, and how hydrous it is. So clearly the matrix um, has a more hydrous component than the wall rock material, indicating that there's probably preferential melting of hydrous minerals in these rocks. And that is definitely strong flavoring of chloride. Um, but that kind of chloride fusion and flavor in the glass is not the only kind that we see um, in the pyridotitic pseudotacolites. Uh, these are images that I actually just got yesterday, but we told you. So um, it's pretty cool that you can see different kinds of flavors emerging when minerals fuse in situ within the mouth. So this is an olivine gray, which is fused, produced this glassy halo, which is this dark gray and uh, diopside and oxide um, crystallizing around the rim. Here is a diopside, the fused, and then crystallized diopside, and has a serpentine-flavored evitrified glass around the rim. Here's a tremolite, the fused, to a tremolite-flavored glass with no crystallites, so just quench. And here is a diopside, which also fused produced a slightly more calcic iron-rich diopside crystallization product rim around it, um, with a chloride flavored glass around it, so it's a stark interstitial material, a visual you know, crystallization product. So we see many different varieties and flavors of glasses within the pseudotacolites, indicating that they're extremely heterogeneous and that we can actually image wholesale fusion of these mineral veins. Um, once again, I just want to remind you um, that you can quite easily separate late hydration from early hydration. Um, so this is a serpentine overprint in the single capital matrix that I'll show you here today. Uh, and here you can see that serpentinization has actually destroyed the delicate textures that I showed you in the previous images associated with direct quenching from the mouth. And this is a chloride glass that is cross-cut by the serpentine, 
it's in a super capitalized matrix. So I'm just very briefly going to go over the GABA because it's a more complex system. I've already kind of done the whole spiel to in prototype. So the GABA system has got a lot more mineral components than the prototype. Um, and it's constrained by hydroclase, epidote, steam, dioxide, actinolite, one blend, and this is the water composition here, polysite and uh, black dots, once again, represent the bulk matrix composition. Uh, what I just want you to observe from this image is that unlike in the peridotite, the GABA composition of the matrix sits quite nicely um, underneath the wall rock bulk composition. So it's a lot more representative um, for modeling in terms of uh, you know, 100% fusion of the wall rock material. So looking at the crystallization products, I've also um, analyzed glass in the GABA, and at these little green triangles, which also sit directly above the black blob, which is um, the pseudocatalyte matrix, and it's also sitting nicely over the wall rock bulk mineral composition. When the GABA fuses, um, we get different crystallization products from the prototype, obviously due to the composition of the rocks differing by so much. So we get steam, uh, glorophane, albite, plagioclase, and a lot of anthracite, which I'll discuss in a minute. The GABA is also not as hydrous as uh, the peridotite. It only goes up to, I think, 4.6 weight percent in water at a maximum. And this is it, it corresponds quite nicely to the, uh, the contents of hydrous minerals that we see in the GABA. The GABA has only got amphiboles in it. It doesn't have anything as hydrous as chloride or serpentine like the peridotite. So it's not going to be as, as hydrous when it fuses. Um, once again, it's quite nicely constrained by both the wall rock minerals that fuse and the crystallization products that quench from the melt. These are some glasses uh, that I've analyzed uh, from the GABRO using BSC. And uh, what we have here is diopside and plagioclase, which fuse, and they have this kind of, <coughs> kind of crystallization front um, directly at the margin of the melting grain, and they produce both of these on the side, and then the leftover glass, which quenches. So, because these complexes are quite complicated and they produce a lot of different kinds of minerals, um, I try to separate them out in terms of temperature. And so, first, um, in the process, once you have fusion, you're going to get anhydrous high temperature of crystallization products. These quench directly from the melt. There aren't really any hydrous high temperature products because these melts occur at such high temperatures that no hydrous minerals should be stable. The melt temperature has been calculated roughly for 1,400 degrees to 1,700 degrees. So in the peridotite, as I told you right before, olivine insertite and diopside crystallize from the melt, which you can see here. And this is wall rock material with that ductile transition zone, which I described to you and showed you before. And as you can see, there's um, zoning uh, in the phosphoric olivine which crystallizes directly from the mouth. And it goes up to a 91 phosphoric content. In the GABRO, the system is actually, the, crystal, the high temperature crystallization system is actually simpler than in the peridotite. Only amphocyte and anophyte crystallize directly from the mouth. So these are all amphocyte skimming of crystals um, kind of swimming around in this black hydrous glass. Uh, and it's important to note that the composition of the anthracite and the anophyte is strongly controlled by whatever surface it's nucleating on. Because as I showed you in the previous images, these grains fuse and then they produce a pool of melt around them from which crystals um, crisp, uh, quench directly using the colder surface of the mineral to form. So they're strongly positionally controlled by this melt, the melt composition from when the wall rock, wall, when the train mineral fuses. So here we see 
ilmenite fusion for me is really beautiful um, dendrites of ilmenite with anthracite interstitial, interstitially located between the dendrites. And here we also have anthracite crystallizing, but down here, which I can actually be <laughs> is a plagioclase grain that's fusing. So this anthracite has a lot more sodium and calcium because it's nucleating on top of the on the surface of the plagioclase grain, which is fusing. And these are very titanium rich anthracites because they've nucleated on the surface of an ilmenite. There's a very strong uh, compositional control on the crystallization products due to the heterogeneity of the melt. Um, looking at these anthracites in a little bit more detail, um, I analyzed the different components of the anthracites and um, I tried to look at some of the high temperature, high pressure characteristics of these anthracites. And it's very important to note that these anthracites are really aluminium rich. They have up to 19%, 19.8% aluminium oxide in their um, uh, in their compositions. So uh, I plotted a total aluminium versus uh, sodium in terms of um, in terms of uh, six oxygen, and what I've got here is typical anthracite taken from deer, um, from deer and data sets of the normal anthracites that you get. This is fasciite, which is what the mineral was previously classified as, and this is um, the anthracite that I've analyzed. And you can see that they have the same trend as anthracites, but they plot just above indicating that they've got a higher CATS and a calcium escalar component. So just to cover what those actually mean, uh, CATS component is basically the tetrahedral aluminium substitution that you get in a pyroxene. So if this is the formula for a dioxide, calcium, magnesium, silicon, oxygen, your CATS component goes into, uh, it substitutes for your silica, so if you've got a lot of aluminium, you've got less silica, you get a high CATS component. And this has traditionally been related to higher temperature and higher pressure um, indication. Escalar component is typically related to high temperature and is associated with a high degree of entropy in a crystal structure. It actually indicates a gap in the crystal structure. So um, uh, a mineral will crystallize very quickly, it's unable to fill all the sites properly, and it gets these holes. So this is calculated using octahedral aluminium, and that will be substituting in your um, M1 and M2 sites. Um, in this case, it substitutes with calcium uh, preferentially in association with sodium, and it substitutes in this area of uh, the formula for pyroxene. So just looking at the escalar components in more detail, if you do some of cations, which in a pyroxene should go up to four, and the escalar and the mole the molar proportion of escalar in the, these minerals, I've compared the anthracite crystallites, which are these gooey green dots, cationite, which is red, um, published anthracite, which is green, and uh, very extremely escalar rich on the sites from Smith 1980. And what we notice here is that there's a very good uh, sort of correlation in terms of this relationship with uh, these on sites with other on sites, and also that they have a very high escalar component, possibly the highest that's ever been analyzed, but I'm not sure. And um, it indicates that they that these are definitely high entropy quench product, products that are forming at high temperatures directly from the pseudotacolytic melt. So after looking at the high temperature and hydrous crystallization products, I want to show you the low temperature products. So in peridotite, um, because it's so water rich and it can't crystallize hydrous minerals, it um, quenches and forms a glass. Um, but after a while, the glass is going to be vitrified to this very microfibrous matrix that we see here, which when analyzed kind of has a correct composition generally. But we know from textures such as this, we have dioxide which crystallized directly from the mud, 
Does this can't be a later hydration um, because this is still so pristine, it doesn't have any bleaching halos, and it's not off anyway. <coughs> then we know that this chloride be vitrified from the matrix, and it's also not a, not a, a low pressure, low temperature chloride. This is nearly pure pine and chlor. Um, so let me see it again. In the gabbro, um, the gabbro can uh, devitrify and recrystallize into a glorophane and albite compelliite type assemblage uh, with speed also. And if you look at the, um, if you look at this matrix image in uh, a little bit more detail, you see that these crystals aren't exactly dendritic or uh, pristine anymore. They're not euhedral anymore. They've been bent and sheared out, and there's a slight fabric that you can see forming in this matrix. And if you zoom out on this exact part and look at it on the thin section, you see these ductile folds, showing that there's a ductile overprint on top of these pseudotacolites. Going back to the pyridotite, after it quenches the form chloride, just to show once again that it's not a, late, a later hydration, these veins sometimes recrystallize to a pyridotitic, lithotitic, phosphogenic, depending on what products are um, composition. So this is an old grain that was in the pseudotacolite matrix. This is all recrystallized matrix, and it has a, a these tiny little minerals are all olivine, CPX, and dioxide. I mean, it's um, I'm just going to briefly go, go over. Um, the so geometry of the chlorides. So these images all show different kinds of chlorides. This is a devitrified chloride from a pseudotacolytic matrix. This is a wall rock chloride, which then get, um, which is associated with other chlorides that have been dragged into the vein and fused. This here, in this really cool delicate texture, you see a uh, glassy matrix which devitrifies the chloride. This is a chloride glass. So what I did was I plotted, I put the chloride through a, re, uh, through a recalculation template that I made, and I looked at tetrahedral aluminium versus the octahedral cations in chloride, and I tried to see what kind of clustering I got. So to see whether this glass is stoichiometric or not. Is it chloride or is it a glassy chloride? Is it a recrystallization? Um, so if the black is the pseudocatalyte bulk matrix from this particular sample, and the pink triangles are this chloride flavored glass, the orange blocks are the wall rock chloride from the same sample, and you can see quite clearly that they don't cluster together, nor are these stoichiometric like the other chlorides. This is also a wall rock chloride, and this is um, a later chloride from an overprint, which is actually from this one. This is actually recrystallized. So, so you can see that uh, the glassy chloride and the bulk matrix are not in any way stoichiometric. So even though they have a composition that at first glance looks like chloride, it actually doesn't have the crystallinity of chloride. So it can't be late. Um, so these pseudotacolites have a lot of hydrous minerals going into them. And the question is, where does the water go? <laughs> At high pressure, people wouldn't think that vesicles could form at 8 kilometers depth. But on closer inspection, inspection of pseudotacolite veins, we see an almost sporogaceous texture of the pseudotacolite. So this is at 20 microns. Um, it's quite high <laughs> resolution. And we see these vesicles, which are pried open by um, the quenched glass within the melt and any crystals that are formed from it. So they, they, they can't always collapse properly because they're held open by the quenched products and that's why they remain. They're also really, really small. Um, looking at this image, you can see that the density of vesicles increases towards the main boundary. And I've interpreted this as showing that these vesicles cannot escape the vein readily. They reach the vein front as it cools, and then they get stuck there. They can't really go anywhere. Even though this rock has been fractured and it's undergone failure, the fluids cannot readily escape the vein. So they stay there. So crystallization from the mouth, plus cooling, 
induces supersaturation of water. So if you have dioxide or a whole bunch of anhydrous minerals crystallizing from your mouth, they're going to supersaturate the remaining mouth in water, which is going to induce vesiculation and facilitate fracturing, which I'm going to get to. So, uh, a lot of the uh, wall rock that I've analyzed and the pristine to attack lights looks like this. It's a nice and firm plastic texture of a kind of happy looking prototype. Um, but often, in association with the pseudotacolite veins, it's particularly in uh, multiple generational pseudotacolite complexes, the water rock starts to look like this, <laughs> which is not so nice, and it's very hydrous. So the idea that we came up with to explain that is that because the fluids cannot readily escape the pseudotacolite veins, they actually hydrate themselves. So when these pseudotacolites quench and fluids are released, as the temperatures cool, they self serpentinize and chlorotize in between the veins. So here we have the wall rock, um, a, a younger generation of pseudotacolites, and an older generation of pseudotacolites being cut through by the younger generation. And you can see in this older generation that it's a lot more fractured and, and veined than the younger generation. I mean, this, this vein over here is a later excavation related overprint. But these veins here do not cut into this younger pseudotapolite. So we've interpret this, interpreted this as evidence of self-hydration. You can also see here in this um, uh, self-hydrated sample when you have a vesicular, uh, vesiculated older pseudotapolite being cut by a younger pseudotapolite. These cavities have all been filled by uh, chloride and then have been cut by a liquid chlorotized matrix. Um, one of the last things I just want to say is that uh, there seems to be a control on vein size and thickness um, by grain size of the wall rock. So the coarser the wall rock material, the thicker and larger the veins are going to get. So in a recrystallized pseudotacolite, which is later cut by another pseudotacolite, we see veins that are a lot smaller. And if we look at them in detail, you can see almost the, um, uh, the superplastic creep that takes place in forming these tiny veins. And because the vein, um, in the course of grain material, um, because individual veins are going, um, individual grains are larger and they're going to fuse, it takes a lot more energy um, to get them to get tangled enough using dislocation creep to fuse, so they get, they get warmer and they and they store more energy than small grains would. And so the smaller the grain size, the more likely to get grain boundary creep, as opposed to getting king banding and deformation twinning, which would store more energy and produce um, a thicker vein and more melt. Um, just ending off pretty much. Um, Looking at experimental work that's been done trying to show the different end member processes of thermal instabilities and dehydration. Um, if we look at dehydration related processes, this is what the experimental work has shown. You get an antigorite, so um, a little capsule filled only with antigorite, which is exposed to shear stresses in order to heat it up, and uh, it dehydrates, forming um, these little nanocrystals of olivine and fluid escapes uh, in a perpendicular direction parallel to signal 1. This is parallel to signal 3. Um, and fluid escapes this way. So we expect to see an, uh, an orientation control fluid crystallization and dehydration. Um, and this is what we see uh, in a high velocity shear apparatus experiment where they've tried to show um, what high strain rates and high differential stresses can produce when we try and help rocks. Um, if we look at my rocks compared to this um, experiment, we see that they are a lot more closely related to um, the high velocity shear experiment than dehydration related experiment. Uh, according to the excavation process, um, 
Whether these pseudotaglines were produced on the down growing seduction path or along the exhumation path, um, we're kind of leaning towards the fact that they're related to the down growing seduction path. And the reason why we think this is because the glasses are so pristine and unaltered. We have this uh, blue schist overprint of glaucophane and albite and ilmenite on top of um, re uh, recrystallizing our pristine oncocytic uh, crystals. We also have oncocyte crystallizing directly from the mouth. And also in the pyridotide, we see these ductile overprints and shear um, and shear out to the tacolites at the boundaries between the, between the pristine pyridotide and the myelinite that surrounds it. So uh, we're taking this to indicate that these pseudotaclides are likely to occur, but not necessarily, on the downgoing path of seduction. So lastly, just in summary, um, I'd just like to say that we can show quite conclusively that we have pre-existing retrograde and prograde mineral, hydrous minerals in the wall rock, and that they, um, and that we can separate late and early hydration, and we can show that hydrous minerals are definitively entrained into the melt, and that they do enhance fusion by um, by allowing water to be released when they undergo wholesale fusion. Um, and this um, greatly enhances the seismicity of the reaction. However, some of the gap rows that are analyzed are completely anhydrous. So you don't always need hydrous minerals to induce uh, seismic failure in these rocks, but they do enhance the seismicity of the failure. And it's not the chemistry of the minerals that control whether you get seismic failure or not, it's the mechanics. So hydrous minerals tend to be a lot more slidey and have a lower viscosity relative to anhydrous minerals in rock. So they're going to concentrate the stress better than any other minerals um, in these rocks. So if, you, if they're in a, perf in, a, in a favorable orientation to the stress field, you're going to exploit any hydrous veins that you've got. Like in the pyridotite where it has a very strong chloride flavor, chlorid chloride veins that pre-exist in the pyridotite were exploited to form these pseudotacolites. And that's it.